the concept of what even $500 million is, is absurd. And the fact that he has to pay that to one state and still is running for president, no black person could get away. No, most people, but particularly a person of color could get away with something like that. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Focus Group Podcast. I'm Sarah Longwell, publisher of The Bulwark, and this week we are talking about black voters. One of the key reasons that Donald Trump's polling has been better in 2024 matchups with Joe Biden than 2016 or in 2020 is Trump's relative strength with black voters, which might seem weird for a lot of reasons, but... When you only include the major party candidates, black voters voted 93% for Hillary Clinton in 2016 and 90% for Joe Biden in 2020, according to the analysis from data firm Catalyst. But now some polls, including a recent one from the New York Times and Siena College, have Trump polling at 23% of the black vote. It's no coincidence that he was beating Joe Biden by five points at the same time. That means that there are a small but meaningful handful of black voters who voted for Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden who are now going to vote for Trump. So, of course, we had to go talk to some people uh, who felt that way. My guest today is a big deal in Democratic politics who can help us explore this dynamic further. My good friend, Ashley Allison, the former National Coalitions Director for the 2020 Biden-Harris campaign. She was also a senior policy advisor in the Obama White House that led African-American engagement in the state of Ohio on President Obama's 2012 campaign. And she is like for real my good friend because one time we got sent to like grown-up politics camp together in the woods one time. And it was during Charlottesville. And we became good friends, and uh, I'm super pumped you're joining me on the podcast right now. Hey, Ashley. Hey, thanks for having me. Uh, so I'm super excited for the conversation. Wait, say, say the thing that you just said to me in the <laughs> before we got on, which is that you used to say you didn't talk to Republicans, but now I'm your favorite person, right? So uh, <laughs> that was editorialized. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> it's not that I didn't use it. To, I didn't want to talk to Republicans. I literally for years did not engage with anyone who identified as a Republican. I had to for a little bit around my work because of criminal justice reform, but I was just like, nope, not going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> but then you met me and your mind was changed. Then, okay, yes, I'm, glad, yes. I'm glad we established and that. Yes. Glad and we then established I grew that. Up and- talk to you. <laughs> so you've been like having this uh, like meteoric rise. You're on CNN all the time now. Like when I met you, uh, <laughs> nobody knew who oh, either, neither of us, neither of us were. <laughs> <laughs> nobody knew who we were. Uh, but you're like famous now. Uh, so what uh, what drew you to politics in the first place? We'll just do a quick little bit about you. Yeah, I mean, I got paid to work on my first political campaign when I was turning 30. So it was a later entry into the political realm. A lot of people start right out of college. I had always volunteered on social justice efforts and um, protesting, being an activist, but never really knew you could make a career out of working in politics. And then this guy called Barack Obama ran for president and introduced the, the, the idea of like being a community organizer and getting paid and committing your life to like working for a greater good. And it was kind of all she wrote because I did it. I got, I mean, I wasn't like I got paid a lot, but I got paid and I went back to my home state and um, I was good at it and I liked it um, because I was engaging with people and meeting them where they are, which is a thing I always say. And it was fun. And so I have just been doing it ever since. All right. So I want to jump right in to the group of black voters who voted for Clinton and Biden who say they're now going to vote for Trump. A very important caveat, though, before we do this. I'm not saying that what you're going to hear today is representative of all or even a majority or even a plurality of black voters. But I think this sound does give us some clues as to why the polls look the way they do at the moment. So let's listen to how these Trump-leaning voters talked about why they're warming up to him after voting for Hillary Clinton and then Joe Biden. I think he just has an, a, more of an ability to jumpstart the economy, to inject energy into the economy. And that's really what a lot of it's boiled down to for me. I think it's kind of opened my eyes to there is no 
standard or traditional or typical president in a sense. With him and uh, Putin from Russia, they had some kind of rapport. And so that sort of keeps us alive without getting bombs, you know, thrown on our country. So it seems like, I don't know, maybe a gangster knows another gangster and they have respect for one another. But it seems like he was able to get along with the people a little better. And he also pays a lot of attention to where the United States is sending money to. We tend to send a lot of money overseas. And I remember when they were looking to approve the stimulus package, you know, this is what, a thousand page uh, act, a thousand page law. And he noticed how congressmen and senators were sending money to their own states and stuff. It was so much fat that was in that bill to be passed for us to get that stimulus check. For me personally, Trump is the only, not the only president to speak against secret societies and what elite people do that have power above him. But he's one of the only people that recently speak about it. And he mainly got demonized because he was literally the president during COVID, which for anybody, that wouldn't be a fair presidency and a fair way to judge because, you know, again, he wasn't in control. He was just the face of what they telling him to say. You know, I didn't necessarily agree with everything he said and how he went about it, but he did, you know, he did hold the country together during COVID. At the time, I didn't appreciate it, but he held the country together during COVID. But you have some countries that are still trying to get it back together. That's why I voted for Kim. A lot of states shut down and they're still struggling. So but he helped keep us on the straight path. So, I mean, I grew up, grew up in the South. And so we were, you know, being black and from the South, you're automatically a Democrat almost. And so we were trained to believe that we vote for this person because you know, this is what's best for us. And I think we were sold a uh, bill of goods. We were given a wooden nickel. Then I voted for Biden because some of the views that I had on Trump in the 2020 election, I didn't think was a good idea after um, all these years of indictments. And it's just everybody else in the media made him look like a bad person. And again, it was peer pressure and influence. Now, this presidential election being, you know, 28, going on 29 years old, actually working in the economy, living the economy, being a part of the people that our president is here to serve. To be honest, Trump would honestly be the best choice. And the only reason why I say that is because of the fact that when he was president, he got respect. I kind of was jumping on the bandwagon with Biden when um, it was like everybody's debt was going to be forgiven for education. And a lot of people are still paying back on student loans. So I just would like for somebody to to be in leadership that's going to stick to their words, whether it's good or bad, you know, nobody's perfect. So I just feel like we are lacking leadership. Okay. Now, a little later in the show, we're going to get to uh, another group of black voters who uh, are they're kind of down on Biden, but they're still going to vote for him. But this was the group that had moved away. So, Ashley, do you think that Biden's trouble and like Democrats in general, the trouble with black voters are overblown, underblown, uh, like right on target? Uh, what what What's going on? What's going wrong for the Dems here? OK, I like to say I know this is a show about black voters, but I want to zoom out for a second and say black voters have voted Democratic for since they have been able to vote, really, um, and have continuously done what they have needed to do to ensure our democracy survives. So there is a frame right now that like, if Joe Biden loses, it's because of Black people. And I think that is false. (laughs) If Joe Biden loses, we're the only demographic of voters that will still vote at a disproportionately higher rate than every other constituency in America. And it still always becomes Black people's fault if we decide to have a difference of opinion versus white women or, you know, um, or rural white voters, or rural (laughs) white voters, right? So I want to just say out front, like, I do not accept the premise that if Joe Biden does not win this fall, and particularly if his percentage numbers of black voters decreases, that is black people's fault that we have Donald Trump as president. So that's my first premise. The question, though, you ask is, do you think that the concern about why black voter, how black voters are feeling about Joe Biden are overblown or not? No, I don't. I don't ever think 
when you are running to be the president of the United States and a demographic that is core to your constituency is a little um, uh, weak or in terms of their support to you, towards you, you should always be concerned. And right now, for a host of reasons, some of which the voters suggested in the focus group, um, there are some conversations that need to be had in the Black community with the Biden administration and the Biden campaign that must happen in order for him to be successful. So I do not think it's overblown. I think it is a solvable, like I have a response to every single thing one of those voters says, and I would not, and the first thing is like, I would not start with like, you're stupid, you're voting for Donald Trump. I'm like, I hear you. Okay, let me, act, let's actually have a conversation because when in the world has you, have you ever won an argument because you loud yeller or you loud, loud, you yell louder? When has that ever worked? So I would have a conversation with these voters and, and um, assume they are working off of facts that they have heard but also present another set of facts that would hopefully over the, and it wouldn't be one conversation over the course of the next eight or so months, um, bring them back to be able to vote for Joe Biden. Uh, so I want to, I want to like grapple with that first point you made a little bit about like, would it be, you know, uh, black people's fault? And I, do you think that's the, I mean, I actually think it's a little bit, and I hear this, I heard this loud and clear in the groups is that when there's a constituency that feels like maybe you take them for granted, which is a thing that just like mm -hmm. th th thematically was through uh, these groups. I think the part of the reason that people are freaking out is that it's such a reliable constituency for Democrats that to see this slide and to see this slide particularly in relation to Donald Trump, who – I think for people in D.C., they're like, but this guy is so racist. Why would black voters like this guy better? It doesn't make any sense to be like, make it make sense. Uh, but one of the reasons I was really um, I really felt I really wanted to do this episode and I really felt like the sound captured it is like there's a whole bunch of reasons these voters kind of lean toward Donald Trump and that there's specific things that he's doing that they find um, like – that they enjoy him or find him, I, I think, I mean, even for the groups that weren't going to vote for him, I have this theory, and you can tell me if this is stupid, but Donald Trump, I find him repellent, but, like, <laughs> voters think he is funny. Voters, not all voters, and, like, mm -hmm. it was sort of in these groups, too, where uh, they, they, like, were making jokes or thought talked about how, like, he was more accessible, like he felt like he connected with people, talked to them less like a politician, which, I mean, if there is a thing I hear from voters just across the political spectrum, um, but like the the Trump voters especially, they just say, you know, a regular politician is the thing they hate more than anything else and that Trump doesn't mm -hmm. feel like a regular politician. And so I think that Trump is uniquely able to pull demographics that have historically voted for Democrats that they're used to relying on, but who find Trump sort of like enjoyable, funny, whatever. Like, what do you think it is about Trump in particular? Do you think I'm off base here? Or do you think there's something about Trump that not just black voters, but like lots of different uh, demographics of voters that he's able to connect to that regular politicians can't? I think this is the $64,000 question, right? Like, why is Donald Trump still around? If this had been... Any, like, Jake Tapper has this series on um, CNN right now called Scandal, yeah. and it's going through white men, particularly, who have done salacious things and no longer are in politics. And that's just, their, like, careers are over. And one would think that Donald Trump would have an episode on that show, but the problem is he's not over. He's still a viable candidate, and it doesn't make sense. So I think there are... Um, a couple of reasons why Donald Trump has become the exception to the rule. And first is his wealth, um, whether you believe he has it or not. Um, I don't know if he has $500 million that he has to pay the state of New York, but he is a wealthy man. Um, most people I know don't have their names in gold letters on buildings. Okay. Um, and Donald Trump has, and he has most of my life. And he also, it was introduced to us through a lens of celebrity and, um, through a lens of celebrity with like a diversity of people. Like I remember his picture with Don King and then I remember him, you know, on The Apprentice. So there is, we don't know him as a politician and kind of his 
brash persona of not really caring is what allowed him to continue to grow. And I think any variation from that, people would say he's kind of folding into this typical Washington, D.C. politician. And we just honestly have not had someone like him before rise in politics and go for it, you know, like actually go for it. There have been celebrities that run for president, but not that, not with that pedigree and not with the approach that he has. He had no policy. He had no infrastructure around um, his campaign in 2016. He just used the media in such a way that nobody else has been able to do it. And when you see, just like on the practical practicing of politics, when people introduce new concepts and ways to win elections, think of Barack Obama and his use of social media, they they crack a code that others try to model that is hard to model. So I think there is something to that around Donald Trump. I don't have the answer why he's so viable. I, I don't, if I knew, I would like, you know, he'd be gone because I would deploy it. <laughs> well, I think what you're saying is you don't know the antidote, but I think you just like totally identified the thing that I think is really hard for people in Washington to get their arms around because we're like, Trump is a racist human. Like, listen to his words. He is yes. very racist. But you just, because of the celebrity, because of the pictures with Don uh, King. Okay, so like, here, I'll try to make an analogy with another thing that I think people sometimes misunderstand about Donald Trump, which is because v- voters, if you ask them about abortion and Trump, nobody thinks Trump is extreme on abortion, even though he put the, the three Do we, Supreme I know, I Court know, justices I know, on I know, the court that overturned Roe. They think he's a social moderate. Why do they think he's a social moderate? Here's what voters say in the groups. They're like, I'm pretty sure he paid for an abortion. Right. Like, so, yeah. <laughs> and so like, but so this thing about the celebrity, right. So he's on celebrity apprentice. What they know is, well, Trump has black friends. Trump hangs around with black people like Trump in a way that the Republican party, they can be like, I think the Republican party's racist, but like Trump, Trump's just a dude like who hangs out with like lots of black people and, you know, and is a celebrity. And so it, it like nullifies some of the yeah. Washington things that we're sure voters will respond to. And they don't respond the way we think we're going to. In fact, in fact, I think we have, um, I think we have sound right now where uh, these voters talked about the Republican Party and the overtly racist things they say. And but don't like tag that to Trump. Let's listen. There tends to still be a lot of racism within the Republican Party, a lot of anti-black. I do agree with the Republican Party's stance on, as the gentleman said, when he mentioned the bathrooms in the schools, I, I said, wow, I'm glad my kids are out of school. I wouldn't know to go in the boys' bathroom or girls' bathroom. So I'm glad that, you know, Republicans sort of, you know, align with that. There's um, a lot of racism, but I have experienced more discrimination within my own race than mm-hmm. I have from people of other races in my life experience. I don't know what other people go through, but... I, this is some what I go through, even from when I was at my firm to in my business. My greatest challenge has been my own people, women that have been meaner, crueler to me, discriminated against me and more and than other people. And my greatest supporters have been people of other races, to my surprise. The faces that represent the different parties, you know, in terms of overall race representation, I think it's much smaller on the Republican side. So I think that allows the stereotype to continue. Because me personally, I do think over these years, in my experience, I feel like the racism is across politics and not necessarily just Republicans. You know, but that is something I think in the back of my head is always kind of there is just that that concern of over racism from the Republican side. So, like, they were still thought, okay, yeah, like, the Republican Party is more racist. This is why I've mainly voted for Democrats. But they've sort of started – you can hear this evolution almost where I always voted for Democrats. I thought the Republican Party was racist. But, like, I – because Trump transcends that, they're now able to sort of do a little bit of rationalizing, right? There's a little Mm – well, but also there's racism across the political spectrum. And so what do you make of – this like, do you think Democrats are relying too much on the idea that black voters will just think the Republican Party's racist and don't realize how much Donald Trump himself transcends some of those sort of old stereotypes about the parties? Yeah. So I again want to start with saying Donald Trump is a, 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 a existential threat to our democracy, and he is extremely problematic because of his racist policies, those he speaks and those he just acts on. Right. Um, and so, and he is unapologetic about it. Uh, and since, not just since he's been president, like 
from his housing discrimination discrimination days, from his um, exonerated five at that point, the Central Park five, some of the things he was doing around that. But I think what people particularly, but in this instance, in this conversation, Democrats often do is they do this comparison of like, well, this guy, I'm not perfect, but this guy is really, really bad. And the reality is, is that like, Most Black people, if not all Black people, have faced some form of discrimination in their life, okay? Um, I have stories of the discrimination that my family members from my aunt's house being set on fire um, in the 70s in our hometown because they were the first Black family to live there to things that I experienced just on Friday, literally, okay? Um... And I don't know if those people were Republican or Democrat, okay? But I do know that I experienced racism in this country. And so, and at times I experienced it through the lens of a Republican party. And at times I experienced it through the lens of the Democratic party. So to tell me to pick which form of racism is better or worse is a illogical question to ask someone who has systemically experienced that in their life. And I think that is the flaw on for many Black people who are just like, I'm not going to think about it through that. Do I think that's a... I think you should be thinking about it through that. But some people in this day and age have decided not to. And then they go back to the thing of this is an economic issue, which in many of the... Um, initial sound that you played, the underlying pinning of all of it was a, a, a message of prosperity, whether it was Trump had an economy that was thriving or Trump exposed the secret society, which made it seem to like it transcends race. And it's about whether it is um, the rich versus the poor and rich cannot be like assigned to race. It's just about like who has had access, whether it's about COVID. Some states were struggling and some states that stayed open were um, um, are thriving. A wooden nickel, one of the brothers said, like, he was like, I feel like I got a wooden nickel, which means like, it ain't no good, <laughs> right? It's not gonna, it's not gonna work for me. You gotta, you gotta, uh, what, what is it? Made out of nickel. Nickels are made out of nickel, but like, I got a wooden nickel or student loan debt. And so if I can have that conversation with somebody about the economy, I, I can get you to Joe Biden. But if you present to me and talk about racism. Again, I, I don't live my life with this, but I do experience some people of color, and in this instance, some Black people who are saying, please don't tell me to pick like which form of racism is worse. That makes total sense. It's all bad. Let's let's not, let's stop it. <laughs> you know? uh, all right. So one thing, so speaking of things that like Beltway people find really racist about Donald Trump that doesn't quite land the same way with voters is like most recently he was doing this thing where he's like, well, because I have a mugshot, black oh, people God. will like me more. Or like the gold sneakers. Like mm-hmm. there's these things he says. And when they hit us here, we're like, this is the most – what are you talking about? Like the mugshot thing especially. Like this is just profound racism straight up. And then we ask – when you ask black voters like um, about the legal cases – there was sort of the general sense that he was being persecuted. Um, and we're used to hearing Republican voters talk about how the legal system and the establishment are out to get Trump. Like, I hear that all the time from the mm-hmm. Republican voters. Um, and one key way that the Republicans usually dismiss the case against Trump is is by saying that all politicians have skeletons in their closet. Like, Trump is not uh, unique. But let's listen to how uh, this group of voters, and again, this is the black voters who were leaning toward Trump, uh, how they thought about his upcoming cases. You were being told he's being indicted for all these things. I mean, <laughs> every single bank right now is violating the guidelines of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. And it takes a million complaints before the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau will even get involved. I don't know who in government is not committing fraud, who's not being crooked, who's not doing us right. I, I really don't know. I don't know why he's the only one that's actually being held accountable. The one year in Atlanta, the RICO case has become a circus. And I just think it's a, at this point a waste of taxpayer money. I can't imagine retrying him again with the new prosecutor using taxpayer money again. This would be the third prosecutor. And to me, I would rather just have it go away than taxpayers pay again to retry it. 
And then the person who is, now, as you know, the prosecutor who is trying him, well, now she's extremely questionable. She's facing probably worse, just as many charges as he is. Well, you ever see the news demonizing somebody, trying to lock them up just for speaking? That person is normally right. I mean, I'm black, so I saw Michael Jackson get killed. I saw the Prince get killed. This by fentanyl, he didn't even do any drugs. I saw Martin Luther King get killed, Fred Hampton, Malcolm X, Jesus. There's all kind of people I can name. So usually that person is right in hindsight. It didn't matter what he did. They were just going to bash him anyway. At least it seemed like maybe three-fourths of the media. Of course, he had Fox on his side, but it seemed like three-fourths of the media was bashing the guys. I'm like, that's unheard of for somebody to get bashed that hard, and he's the president of the United States. So that may be put a red flag in my head that maybe he's on to something. If you look into the closet of all those folks, I mean, come on, you'll find all kinds of stuff. So why he gets all this stuff and they're trying to make all this stuff stick, that's a red flag again for me. So it makes me think that that's just another way they're trying to keep him out or to shut him down. So again, to be clear, 83% of black voters view the legal actions against Trump as appropriate, according to a USA Today poll. But some still believe, as you just heard, uh, that the legal system is out to get Trump, or at least that most politicians are guilty of something. So it's a little like of the both sidesism. Do you know? Do you do you know the SNL skit where they have Tom Hanks and then like two black women, and it's a game show? It's like a Jeopardy. Oh, yeah. Do you know yeah, the one I'm talking I, about? Yes, yes, yes. I rewatched it again recently. I don't know why it was like resurfaced on Twitter or something. And the point that it is making, it's a very funny skit, but the point that it is making is sort of that there can be this um, cultural overlap between these sort of white working class Trump voters and these working class black voters that actually you think of them as these very different sort of cultures. But when you drill down on some of them, because I got to tell you, when I was I thought of that skit the whole time I was listening to this group because they Mm -hmm. sound like every two time Trump voting group that I do, right? The yeah. like deep state is that is there um, that uh, that they they are out to get Trump with the legal system. The what about what about Fonnie mm-hmm. Willis? Um, and so uh, I guess I guess I want to ask you like, is there a skepticism that you see in the black community of like government and the legal system in general that actually does allow people to see Donald Trump? Uh, Black voters in particular to see Donald Trump as more of a victim of this stuff. Mm -hmm. So to your first point, I think uh, I bet you never thought Fred Hampton would get named dropped on your uh, podcast twice in one day. So Jesus, Donald Trump is just like Jesus and MLK, (laughs) these kinds of things. So, okay. So the, to, to your point about two time working class Trump voters and black voters that have skepticism, the, the, the reason why Fred Hampton was a revolutionary thinker that was killed was because he was trying to draw the similarities in those two bodies that like your um, suffering doesn't have to be in isolation. And it is rooted in this same belief of the rich keep getting richer and the poor keep suffering. And as long as they keep the poor divided and feeling that one is better than the other or that you can't live and thrive together, they win. And the they in that scenario is Donald Trump. And so he has tapped into the skepticism that is justly, that justly exists. We we cannot deny that our criminal justice system um, disproportionately incarcerates black and brown people, but particularly black men and then black women compared to our white counterparts. Like, it is a fact. Um, And so when you use a nugget of truth, but you distort it like Donald Trump does, you have a chance. Again, that's why you don't, that's why you see 83% of Black people saying, no, you did something wrong. So you're going to get charged and go through the jury process and the outcome will be what it is. But there is that ability to take a, a nugget of truth, distort it, and then be able to begin, pull some people off. And that is what Donald Trump is so good at doing. And, and we have to push back on it. Like the reality is, if Donald Trump would actually tell the truth, it is not because 
he has a mugshot that black people are supporting him. That is offensive. That is looking, that is saying that black people are criminals, that black people only are seen and only experience life through the criminal justice system. And that is not true. But what he is doing is saying like, look guys, they're picking on me too. I'm one of you. And we know that he's not one of us. He is the exception to the rule. If that, if Donald Trump was Barack Obama or Donald Trump was me, I would already be in jail. I wouldn't even have, like, I would not even probably be able to post bond. I wouldn't even, like, the thought of having to pay $500 million, I was telling somebody, like, the fact, the concept of what even $500 million is, is absurd. And the fact that he has to pay that to one state and still is running for president, no black person could get away. No, most people, but particularly a person of color could get away with something like that. And so Donald Trump takes that little sliver of truth and says, I'm going to distort it into my, in my, in my favor. And without having a fact checking media or broader ecosystem, it can get a little traction. Um, on the on the sneakers bit, I mean, it is it's 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 interesting. It's not surprising that he put out a pair of gold sneakers. First of all, I think he might get a trademark um, lawsuit from Christian Louboutin because he put red bottoms on it. And I hope he doesn't. I hope he drags them through court and has takes every little penny of those little five hundred dollars sneakers he ever made. Um, but he went into a subculture. He went into a culture where most so there's this new thing now, right? Like sneakers are a part of like hip hop culture from like the beginning of Run DMC wearing the Adidas. It's an evolution of culture that has been like very specific to the black community that now has become a larger marketing effort. And, but the question I bet, and like people wear sneakers on the house floor now, like it's a part, they have sneaker balls. Like I wore, wore sneakers Last year, I wore Jordans, like gold and black and white Jordans to an award gala with a formal gown. It's a part of like culture. And so Donald Trump was like, I'm probably not going to get every person. And and to be fair, it wasn't just black people at the sneaker con festival that they have. But like, I could get some. And you know what? Nobody else is going to go there. So let me see if I can do that. It's not because black people are... Um, so caught up in the allure of gold sneakers that that they think that is what makes a president. But again, he takes a little sliver of culture. He manipulates it, still uses it for his own good because all of that is going to his legal defense. And he tries to see if, you know, he throws a, a fish out on the hook and sees if anyone bites, right? Do I think that will be why Donald Trump wins if he wins in the um, uh, general election? No, but again, he runs the gamut of just doing like throwing spaghetti at the wall and sees what sticks. And most people, when they throw spaghetti at the wall, they have to clean it up after Donald Trump never has to clean it up. He just leaves it. He leaves it for the mess for somebody else to clean up and he goes and he makes another room dirty. Um, And so until we can like figure out the intervention to be like, no, go clean it up. And some of these court cases might be the last backstop to have him have to clean it up is why is why I think right now, like we're recording this after the Supreme Court decided about the immunity, whether they're going to hear the case on immunity. It's why some of these cases are so important because it's a test of our institution if anyone is above the law, including Donald Trump. And my final point I'll just make on this is one of the voters was saying that, um, you know, uh, it's kind of like he's the only one being held accountable. That's not true. Barack Obama, they FOIA emails, they tried to take that man down, but he did not do anything wrong. So they were not able to. Joe Biden, you see right now, they're trying again after again with impeach attempts to impeachment, but there is nothing there. And so the reason why it's not Joe Biden is not not going down and not being impeached because the system is working to protect Joe Biden the, and, and what Donald Trump is trying to get you to say is like, yeah, we're all crooks. I'm, I am a bad guy. Like he's acknowledging I do bad things, but everybody does. But that's not true. Everybody doesn't break the law. 
everybody. And so you say that to people with the hope that people will say like, yeah, like everybody does break the law. No, we don't. Most people don't break the law. Um, particularly black people. Most black people don't break the law. But if you try and feed folks this belief that I do, then maybe you can carve off a sliver of people. Joe Biden is not being indicted because Joe Biden has not broken the law. Joe Biden is not being impeached because he has not committed an impeachable offense. Donald Trump was impeached because he not just attempted, he almost overthrew the election in our democracy. And not just that, he is saying he will do it again. So if you want to live in an authoritarian country, then support Donald Trump. But if you want your rights and privileges that you are afforded by our constitution, Donald Trump is not your guy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, do, but this is, so I agree with that. And I think we should just like cut that whole riff out and just like release it on its own. But my question, listening to all of these, like, they are just not thinking about whether or not we live in authority. The word authoritarianism came up zero times. The word democracy in these groups came up and it never comes up. None of the groups yeah. that come up. Yeah. So uh, one, one thing I'll say is that what I am talking about now is a political practitioner trying to figure out how to solve the problem of Donald Trump. If this was a different type of conversation of just like bash Donald Trump, I can do that too. And if you ever want me on the show to do that, I'll ha- I'm happy to do that. I want to put that like, because it for a listener, they may be like, well, is she saying Donald Trump is like truthful? No, I don't think he's truthful. But I think he is strategic in the way he uses the truth to manipulate people. So this is me saying like, this is my theory. I think on you're being super clear. I think interventions clear. on Donald Trump. Okay. Um, in the world of the internet, you got to be clear, clearer sometimes, okay? <laughs> I want to be real clear on where my position is. I don't know. if I don't know. Do people want to live in an authoritarian society? Absolutely not. Do people fully grasp what we mean when we say um, uh, some of these words? I'm not sure. If you So, for example, when uh, Roe v. Wade, when the Dobbs decision came down, um, I remember crying because I knew, well, first when RBG died, I'll never forget that night. Um, and I remember what that meant and what that was going to mean. And I was like watching the clock for when it was going to happen. And then when Roe fell and was no longer the law of the land, I cried again. And I remember like, oh God, I remember the stories. I grew up with a a, a mom who still to this day tells the stories that people don't often want their children to know, force us to watch things so we grew up aware of what we had, even though we never might have lived without it. And so now you see women who did not realize what the fall of Roe would actually mean and and actually thought that they were going to be the exception to the rule. They were going to be able to go across state lines and pay for their abortion. They were going to be able to find IVF all the time. And now we have this cascading effect where it is truly what authoritarians do. I always say that the Alabama Supreme Court justices just didn't get the memo to wait until, let's see if Donald Trump won to put that IVF decision out. Like, this is the plan all along around the fall of Roe, is to really take control over women's bodies. And so if you don't like that infringement of your right, wait till you live in authoritarianism. And I think there is this thinking that, like, I'm going to be the exception to the rule that like he won't do the bad things to me. He will. Donald Trump will do the bad things to anyone that is not him or will not fall, kiss the ring and do the thing. So I don't want to say like people want to live in an authoritarian world, but I think there is this belief that I can be the exception to Donald Trump's uh, authoritarian reign. And there is this belief that he's really not going to do it. But let me be very clear. In 2016, there was fear of that. Um, and he showed his hand as a, a president for four years. In 2024, he is saying the quiet part out loud. He is saying to us, I am going to be a dictator. And if you do not, and I think this is also a little bit of a fault of the the schools, is like, we don't know what it was like to grow up in Venezuela. We don't know what it was like to grow up in Cuba, these authoritarian places. And so... Without the knowledge of it, it's hard to really conceptualize what America would look like without a democracy. But it is possible, and we are hanging by a thread, and this election cycle is the thing that might be the, 
it'll either be the scissor or it'll be the needle to sew it back together. I want to play one last brutal bit of sound. Okay. Because one key reason for these voters' discontent with the Biden-Harris administration was the Harris half of the ticket. Uh, let's listen. Mm-hmm. I used to be a Democrat, not anymore. And I'm very disappointed in our vice president. She's not representing my people very well. If anything, she's making us look like we're lazy. You know, as a African-American woman, I had an expectation that she was going to be in her P's and Q's to, you know, open up the opportunity for others. But I barely see her. So if she's representing us as if we're lazy, oh, how is that supposed to provide an opportunity for the rest of us that are actually on top of our A-game, those that are actually qualified to be the vice president, those that don't mind really putting in the work, I barely see her, even if she's not lazy. I would expect to see her always on camera saying, this is what's going on in the economy, this is what I'm going to do. I want to see somebody's hard work. So when she was in California, I believe, as a prosecutor, and just as far as how, I guess, my people were treated by her, I mean, she was laying the hammer down like she was prosecuting left and right. Mostly my people uh, were getting prosecuted the toughest. So I didn't really know what to think about her, but I knew just with her record as a prosecutor, I just didn't really see just what she was going to really bring to the table. I thought she was just somebody that they got um, just to sway the uh, black vote more so than anything. If you look back at her record as a prosecutor, how many people were were prosecuted and trumped up charges or... Things put uh, witnesses that weren't credible. So, I mean, she wasn't a credible person from the beginning. So I didn't think all of a sudden she was going to get in this stage of her life and be the most honest person either. Okay. That was, but here's the thing. It's going to, I'm going to make this a little bit worse because I would now want to play from a different group that we did that was uh, black voters who were going to vote for Biden and Harris. Uh, And I want to play what they said about Harris. We hardly don't see her. We don't see her. Yeah. Where is she? I feel like they we can't her find her. <laughs> I'm glad that Kamala is VP. I hated when he said that he was going to pick a black woman as VP. I wish he would have just done it and said, yo, she is qualified. She is the best person for the job. She's intelligent. She, She's qualified. She just has no flair until it's time to bring up that she went to Howard. And then all of a sudden, she has a little twang in her voice. And like even when she shared her cooking for Thanksgiving, it didn't look like there was much seasoning. And I did hear that she had a history of helping uh, certain people in California, uh, Black males in particular. She helped that percentage go up with incarceration. She's qualified. She's very intelligent. And sure, she has a shaky background with some of the things that she's done in the community. But if she was such a qualified candidate, that it just felt like kind of fishing for votes early. Like, hey, I'm going to put another Black person in office versus, hey, I have a qualified uh, VP who happens to be a Black woman. Okay. So one of the reasons I was dying to have you on this is because I know you will talk to me for real about this problem. Because, listen, the favorite parlor game in D.C. or just out there is... Okay, Biden is an old, old man, which Mm -hmm. means his vice president becomes much more important and she is even less popular than he is. Uh, And I guess I've been pretty surprised. This is not the first time we've done groups of black voters. And this thing of where is Kamala Harris? uh, That was the first time I heard somebody be like, it makes us look lazy. I've never heard that before. I think that was just a very specific opinion of that one person. But like the where is she? is constant, including from uh, like white libs who really love her and are rooting for her. And so is it like, so So the parlor game is people being like, can we replace Kamala Harris on the ticket? To which mm-hmm. everybody says no, because it will alienate black voters, especially black women who are like the core of the core. Is that true though? I mean, I'm just like surprised listening to these voters, how much they're not into Kamala Harris. Man, Sarah, if we had more time, I would tell you how hard it is to be a black woman in America. <laughs> you can tell me. I would like to. Is it? But is are you saying that in terms of how it's hard for Kamala? Like she's not getting a fair shake. You think? No, she's not getting a fair shake. Um, and nobody expected her to because that's what it. That's what happens when you make history, and particularly when you make history as a black woman. I am not giving Kamala Harris a pass. I think that every person 
when you ascend to a certain level of success, you deserve to be scrutinized. Um, But the reality is for most presidents, Obama to, I don't even know who George Washington's vice president was. He was the first president of the United States. I mean, we don't, right, think about it. Who was who was Abraham Lincoln's vice president? Who was JFK's vice president? I did not know there was going to be a test. We don't know. You know why? <laughs> because you don't see the vice president. Because that is their role. They are the vice for a reason. They are a fill-in when the president is, un- is unable to hold a certain scope of work. So to think. I do think John think. Adams. I do think John Adams was the VP for Washington. Perhaps. And I'm pretty sure of that. I also think you might have just Googled. No, I'm joking. (laughs) But I'm not saying that, like, I'm not saying this to, like, say we should know. I'm just saying that, like, if you would have asked that component, if you would have asked them, like, who was the president, who was the vice president during um, George Herbert Walker's tenure? You know, it's just this thing of, like, there's this expectation that people put on her. That was unfair because they're because when you are a history maker, you expect them to make history in every day occurrences of the role. But the problem is, and this is the thing that most people don't say when they're like, well, where is she? If Kamala Harris on day one came out and tried to overshine Joe Biden, what do you think the narrative would have been about her then? An aggressive loud mouth black woman who doesn't know her place so it's like half a dozen six what is it six eggs half a dozen one way or the other right it's like she had to learn the role she had to figure out how to support the president which is what ultimately the job of a vice president is she got some of the hardest portfolios that no president let alone vice president has been able to solve she didn't run away from them. She took them like a G. She said, I'm up to the challenge. I'm going to try. If she would have been like, no, 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 I don't want. Then we would have been like, she's lazy. So I think that there is this narrative that never gave her space to succeed. I also think that some people just didn't want him to have a black. There were other candidates that could have been selected as, as vice president that people just might not have wanted it to be Kamala. And so... Or the vice, or, or um, Vice President Harris. So I think that there are like different factions of why people are not falling over themselves to support Kamala Harris, and I think one of the main reasons is because she's a black woman. Because it's actually funny, the one voter that said the thing about her being lazy was the same voter who said the thing about being having more discrimination from black women um, than other people from other race. So it kind of like, it, there's a there's a trend there if you actually listen to that voter's comment. I'm not saying she doesn't have the right to her opinion. Fine. I'd be happy to have a conversation with that voter and really dig a little deeper. But what I will say is that I think the vice president has found her stride. I think she has realized that Washington, D.C. is not where she is going to win this election. It's going to be out talking to voters. So she has said since Roe, and she is uniquely positioned to talk about some of the issues that are front and center in our country, whether it be social issues or whether it be economic issues. Who better to talk about what it means not to have a constitutional right than a woman because of the fall of Roe? So she has been out. She has traveled to, I think, like, when I last talked to her team, it was like 37 states. At this point, it's probably almost in the high 50s, or excuse me, in the high 40s, traveling, having roundtables, talking to physicians, talking to women um, around the culture wars at Ron DeSantis. She's been going out toe-to-toe saying, like, you won't erase our history. So I think she has found her stride. I think she needs to just continue to be out having conversations with people, tackling the tough issues. Look, yesterday, she did something that people in our base, Black people, young people, Arab American Muslims, she called for an immediate ceasefire. Where are the folks saying, you know, like on the on the foot of the Edmund Pettus Bridge where Black people were beaten for wanting to have a democracy, she called for an immediate ceasefire. Not after Joe Biden did, but she led the way on that. And I hope she gets credit for doing that. Um, but people go silent when she does good things. People, and, and that's when there is this um, phrase we have in the progressive and democratic space that maybe your audience has heard or not, but it's like, trust Black women. 
stand with black women. And the, the, uh, the origin story around that was actually, it was trust black women to make choices about their own reproductive, just re- own reproductive um, freedom. And now it has become kind of a, a rally and cry about like, we can make choices about our body and we also can make choices for our community to be better. And I think Kamala Harris is leaning into that. I think she had a very steep mouth. It's hard to be the first, but um, I don't think she will be the last. Uh, I support her. I have met with her many times. I remember working with her on the campaign. She's one thing no one should ever say about that woman is that she's lazy. She, she has run the second largest uh, department of justice in California uh, she took Brent Kavanaugh to task. You know, like she has done the thing. She is not lazy. She is capable. She is competent. Um, and I look forward to seeing what's in the future for her. Should she be held account as a vice president? Absolutely. Just like everyone, should she be held to a double standard? No. But that's what we do for women in leadership. I don't know. I'm trying to decide whether I want to argue with you about this or not. Uh, argue. So, well, it's more <laughs> or, of a t- or pushback. Pushback. Well, it's more of a time thing. But I guess so. That was a you know, stirring defense of, uh, you know, Vice President Harris. And I think that there's a, and also, but you kind of didn't answer the question about, so like, you were, I guess you did. You do not think she should be replaced on the ticket. Absolutely not. Okay, but what do you do about the fact that like from, okay, we're facing down this huge threat and she's not popular. I mean, I guess, what is the White House you say she was given this lousy portfolio, like not even lousy, it was just like a hard one, right? Like the tough issues, immigration. And they seem like it seems like she has uh, and, and like even these voters, they didn't like the idea of just putting her out there as like the black uh, vice president or like the woman. Um, mm-hmm. And so and now I hear that from a lot of this is again, I hear that from a lot of Trump voters too. they do not like it when things are made about race or made about gender. They right. just want mm-hmm. people. Um, but I guess like. How should they deploy her? How should she deploy herself? Like when you say that this, you know, she called for the ceasefire, um, I did have the reaction of like, is that sanctioned? Like, like what's the choreography of this? Is this that she is uh, meant to speak to a constituency in the Democratic Party that Joe Biden literally just can't speak to? Yeah, but but yeah, listen yeah. to this. Joe Biden called for gay marriage before Barack Obama. I did. remember it. I remember and people it. looked at Joe Biden like he was a cavalier who stood for justice. That is not. And, and that is. And I fundamentally believe because Joe Biden was a white man bucking and going ahead of the black president. Kamala Harris did something before the president did it. And people, the only people I see really saying like, wow, she did that are black people on Twitter. Why is it not, and this is what I mean, the double standard of leadership for women, but particularly Black women in leadership. Where is the the support in saying she, she stood in her truth, she stood in her power and did it before? Do I think that Joe Biden probably is going to call for a ceasefire in the State of the Union? Most likely, because I think Kamala Harris has shown herself to be a vice president that always aligns with where the president is, as most vice presidents do. But there still is just this like, we remember that day and it moved the president and we were grateful in that moment that Joe Biden did that to get Obama where he needed to be. I'm grateful Kamala Harris did that because if Joe Biden is not there, hopefully that will get him to where he needs to be. But where's the defense of her? All right. Right. We're up against time. We're up against yes. time. So I got to move on <laughs> from this one. I hear you. I hear you. I just, you know. I, you know. I, I just like to, I don't like to talk about it through an emotional, I really do like to talk about it through like actual experiences because I have said since November that she should get out ahead of the president because I think she was there already, but she didn't. And so she didn't get credit for supporting him. But now that she is doing the thing that the majority of the Democratic Party has asked or her voters have asked her, she's still, and it's just like, can the woman win? And I think as like, what I would do, I don't think this is the campaign's responsibility, but as someone who is a believer in having leadership that is representative of our population, it's my responsibility to call that hypocrisy out in people and be like, why did you do it for Joe Biden, but not for her? That is what we're talking about when we say like, there is a double standard in leadership and it's hard to be a black woman in leadership. Uh and I guess I can I can absorb and understand and even um, like give credence to 
the frustrations and yet I still have sort of like a cold, let's just say hypothetically that he had a um, cheerful a uh, softball coach like lesbian as a vice president, okay? And I felt <laughs> deeply connected to her yeah. as a, like, whatever. Uh, I, if that uh, softball coaching lesbian was so deeply unpopular and we were up against Donald Trump, I think I would still be like, sorry, she's she's got to go. Uh, like, I, I, there's just this, like, what do you do about the fact that voters – you, like the sort of the, yeah. the why doesn't matter. Like what matters is how do you beat Donald Trump? And if she's not the best person to help do that, I mean, there's nothing to be done at this point. But I think this yeah. is this is the thing I think people wrestle with. Well, I guess my I don't think that like changing your vice president is the thing that is going to beat Donald Trump. Yeah, if it's Joe Biden that will beat Donald Trump, and like it it feels unfair to say that if. It, it is wrong. I think it is wrong. And again, I think it, um, no one, we can contort ourselves into pretzels to make this be black people's fault if Donald Trump wins. And we can contort <laughs> ourselves into pretzels. No, I'm not saying you are, but this is just like, I really, we, you said you wanted to have an honest I conversation. Do, this I is do. like, and we can contort ourselves into pretzels to blame Kamala Harris if Joe Biden loses. But in what world has it ever been? Like when Hillary lost, did we blame Tim K- Tim Kaine? You're right. I like forget who she ran with all the time. <laughs> yeah, no, you're right. But right, like okay, you know, right. did right. we blame Tim Kaine? But no, no, but I think no, it's because Joe, you know? no, because Joe Biden's a thousand years old. Like that's the why it matters more who his vice president. Sure. sure. So I think there's just this highlight. Okay, I have to do. I have to move on because okay. there's this. I want to just uh, close. I can talk with, about this all day. I know, and we should. I like wish that I had left more time. Um, uh. I want to close with this broader discussion about these Democratic leaners who, again, were all pretty much going to vote for Biden. So they were. Mm -hmm. Um, And as much as they didn't really like Trump or Biden, they did think that Trump was pretty funny. And uh, they had like the same complaints as the Trump leaners. Um, Let's listen to that. I think Trump just feels younger physically with Biden. It's the like the mumbling and not sure if he's like sleep. That's the type of thing. Also, like um, when Trump is speaking, because he speaks with his hands, it feels more active. He's more animated, so that feels younger to me. So, plus, you know, you know, the spray tan helps. <laughs> spray tan helps. <laughs> you know, no. uh, orange is the new black. <laughs> no, no, good job. Just joking. Just joking. Stop shucking and jiving for black votes every four years. Like, I'm older than most of the folks on this panel, and this has been going on for decades where they don't think, they don't hear, they don't know anything about us. They don't, you know, have anything to say to us until it's time to vote. And it's like, hey, come on, black people. Someone said earlier, fall in line. And that's exactly what they expect. What I feel is that with the Democratic Party, it seems like all the things that they want for the people, like the student loans, like, You know, that was going to be a a, a key point. They never have funding anymore. But when Republicans run and they're in charge, there's always funding for everything that has nothing to do with helping people in the Democratic or in that like blue collar worker. It's it's always, oh, they have funding for businesses. They have funding for wars. They have funding for this. But then when Democrats say, hey, let's help the people. Let's do this. They're like, oh, sorry, bill doesn't pass. We can't help you. I just remember Biden say, if you don't vote for me, you're not black. Or if you're black, you have to vote for me. Hey, I, I it's it's too much. And for me to, to you know, be in, in, in the same place, I don't want to curse, but it's just like, what do they want us to do? This could not be our options again. Democrats are um, weak. I think that they don't speak up when they should. They don't fight like they should. They don't represent the Democratic Party is they like just get deboed. If you know the movie Friday, they get ran over. They don't stand up. They don't boast when they should. They don't fight like they should. Like I am so disappointed with the student loans with them. I'm just it. They don't have enough 
I think I'd be more likely to not vote than switch parties. But I think that the expectation that, oh, Black people are going to fall in line, women are going to fall in line, Muslim Americans are going to fall in line, Asian Americans are going to fall in line. And so I can just give them the barest of their minimums and they'll just do what I what we expect them to do. That is frustrating. So I guess listening to that group was ext- – how much that group who was they were like I'm gonna vote for Biden like yeah mm-hmm, like against Trump mm-hmm. I will but they also had, they just sounded just like the other group in terms of they take us for granted and I'm frustrated with the weakness there was a lot of concern about um, this is one of my least favorite Joe Biden policies uh, but the student loan forgiveness people were upset that that ultimately didn't go through got overturned by the Supreme Court so like. This is your job, <laughs> and you've got a tough one, uh, as a political practitioner, is to help uh, voters who feel this way feel like it's worth voting for Joe Biden and Kamala mm-hmm. Harris. So, like, how are you going to do that going into 2024? So when you put up Joe Biden against Donald Trump, like, what I heard in those voters is that they want a fighter. And what I also know about Donald Trump is that he will break the law. Right. Like he will. John, Donald Trump did things that his base really loved, like putting a citizenship question on the 2020 census in an effort to most people believe put fear in immigrant communities to identify where people were. The Supreme Court overturned that, too. Um, and they were not able to have it on the question. But the fear was and the damage was already done. So it's not like it just happened. And they and they didn't fight it. They didn't try and change it. They were like, okay, we might, tr-, but they they didn't have time to, to remedy to do to actually have it be on the the questionnaire. So it happens on both sides. Um, like when Obama was in office and people challenged the or the ACA, it ended up going in his favor. So like the Republican Party tried to dismantle the Affordable Care Act, but it just didn't work. So it's not this is not a new thing. I think, though, what Donald Trump has introduced is like this prerogative to fight in a way that like breaks the law that I don't want the Democrats to go to that level. I think that that is where you begin the slippery slope of breaking the law, uh, destroying the Constitution and going into authoritarianism. Um, So that's my first take on that. My, My second thing is. Again, I would love to have a conversation because I, too, really like I know you aren't a fan of it, but I love the student loan debt forgiveness program. I pray one day that I become a chosen one, (laughs) that my debt is forgiven from law school. Um, And it was overturned by the Supreme Court. But the reality is, even since that decision, tens and hundreds of thousands of people's debt has still been canceled because the Department of Education has figured out a way to still proceed within the guidelines of the um, uh, parameters of the law. The way democracy works is they're right. Like voting rights, George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, all those things were stopped. It was stopped because we didn't have enough votes to get it done in the Senate. The way we can change that is like either elect senators who will actually get rid of the filibuster that we don't need to meet a 60 vote threshold or elect more senators to get to 60 that would vote for that to be law. We just don't have that. And I don't, and, and there, and the systems were put in place for various reasons. We don't have time. That's a whole nother podcast conversation, but they are put in place so that progress can be, I was talking to a a Republican. I think this was actually after I met you and he was like, the, this structured that way so progress is slow. It's like they literally they're like we don't want the the societal infrastructures to swing so fast on a pendulum. That's why the Senate is structured that way. So if you want progress to be expedited, you have to engage in the democracy in all different levels. And so what I hear those folks say is they want some they want a fighter who is going to figure out how to get it done. And really, the way to get it done is that you can't have the president up there by himself without the majorities, without enough votes to pass the legislation. Um, You can't have a a president up there without governors who will accept the funding to improve the quality of schools, to improve the quality of your roads, like what's happening with the infrastructure bill. You can't have a state legislator in place that, like in my home state, when you actually pass a ballot initiative that that codifies abortion in the constitution that then does everything they can to prevent the will of the people. 
So I often say like, yeah, I want a fighter too, but the only way I can get a fighter is if I set the people up to win once they get in the ring. And right now, because the way the conversation is structured around elections is that people think the president, the reason why Trump needs to go down is because we don't live in a monarchy and the president doesn't have total rule. And so the same reason why Trump has to be held accountable is the same reason why you can't leave the president sitting alone because he doesn't govern by decree. He governs by the will of the people. And there are people all throughout our government infrastructure that have to be aligned with the president's vision to actually give the people what they want. And we just haven't seen it happen in a very long time, if ever, maybe. Ashley Allison, my friend, thank you so much for your insight and coming on and talking this through. And thanks to all of you for listening to another episode of the Focus Group podcast. We will be back next week where we're covering another U.S. Senate race, the Republican primary in Ohio. You won't want to miss it. See you guys.